turn this evening to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. There's another verse here which perhaps could well have been my text this evening. That's the phrase at the end of verse 24. So run that ye may obtain. And Paul's subject in these verses is the rigors of true self-denial. I keep under. The phrase literally means I hit below the eye. Some people hit their dog on the nose to keep it subdued. And the apostle here, in a sense, refers to his body. By that, he doesn't mean his physical body, literally, but he means his natural inclinations, the old flesh with its love of ease and earthly enjoyment. He says, I keep it subdued. I keep it under control. How far removed this is from the soft, pampered Christianity which some portray today. We are saved by grace, they say. We are set free from the curse and the guilt of sin. And therefore, we can take things easy, not the apostle. And doubtless here, he will say only a chapter or so later, be followers of me, even as I am of Christ. Imitate, that word means, mimic. I keep under my body. I keep it subdued. I hit it, as it were, under the eye so that it doesn't begin to control me and to dictate my lifestyle. So that's the subject this evening. Well, how does Paul get here to these verses, I mean? Usually, Scripture gives us a general principle by which we are to live and then applies that principle in practical situations. But in this chapter, the Apostle Paul really has done the very reverse. He's spoken about his own personal situation, how he has conducted himself at Corinth. And as he works through his thinking, his attitude and approach to gospel ministry at Corinth, he arrives, perhaps rather belatedly, at this general principle from verse 24 to verse 27, where he speaks of how he practices self-denial and how he exhorts us, likewise, to follow him in pursuit of self-denial. Really, he's been talking about self-denial almost all the way through this chapter. Remember how in verse 15, verse 12 as well, he's pointed out that a minister of the gospel has a divine right to be supported in that gospel ministry. But he tells us in verse 15, I have used none of these things. And I'm not writing to you, he says, so that you should do this for me. And in verse 18, he is going to go on to say that he makes no charge, or he makes the gospel of Christ without charge, without cost. Literally, the Corinthian believers, they heard the gospel freely. He taught and preached and exhorted and instructed amongst them free of charge. That was his choice. How did he come to that point? It made it difficult for him. There must have been times when, as he was making tents, perhaps at unearthly hours, simply to secure an income by which he could live, there must have been times where he was weary, 
times when his body, if you like, would say, Paul, why don't you just lay down your needle and thread and speak to these Corinthian brothers and sisters? You've done so much for them. You've labored amongst them. Sometimes you've been buffeted and abused for your labors. Why don't you just ask them to support you in this role? It would be so much easier. Paul says, I keep under my body those natural desires that I would have to make my life easier, uh, to make preaching the gospel less uh, burdensome. No, I will not do that, he says. Here at Corinth, he recognized that he needed to deny himself in order to better advance the gospel. This wasn't about Paul being a sucker for punishment. It wasn't because Paul in some way wanted to draw attention to himself for being measly in what he provided for himself. It was because of this unique situation, or perhaps not unique, but uh, out of the ordinary situation, whereby if he had drawn uh, some sort of support from these Corinthians, the opponents of the apostle would have made a meal of it and used it to undermine his authority and discredit his motives. And so therefore, he took none of these things. He was a man of self-denial in that sense. So I want to just take you th briefly through verses 16 to 23, where Paul continues to explain his approach to gospel ministry at Corinth. And then we'll look at this general principle, which has so much to say to us from verse 24. So first of all, look at verse 16. There's something for us to learn here. He says, though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Paul knew it was a privilege to be engaged in gospel ministry. But at the same time, he knew that it was also a necessity. He had a responsibility, a charge before God. He had been entrusted with that gospel pound. He had therefore a duty. There are times when this is such a help to us when we may be tempted to pride in the Lord's work. Well, look at me, I'm a preacher. The devil tempts us and says, you should be very proud that you're a preacher. Look at me, I'm a Sunday school teacher and I have the charge of 10 children or whatever. We can focus upon those things and become rather pleased with ourselves. The apostle didn't think like that. He said, Though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast in because necessity is laid upon me. He looked at the duty, the obligation. I remember once being told years ago, if you're an office bearer in the church and you're tempted to pride, look at the obligation, the responsibilities that you have before God. You're charged with the care of the church. You're charged with the Lord's business. Focus upon that and you can never be proud. So the apostle goes on, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe. Why? Because the Lord has given to him something that is a great privilege to hold and to minister with. How it should make us prayerfully anxious. We can learn from this mindset. We're called to witness. All of us who have come to know the Lord this evening, we understand something of the doctrines of salvation. What are we doing with that talent that the Lord has given to us? Are we faithful in witness? Or do we hide our pound in the napkin as the parable goes on? And we say to the Lord, here's, the, here's your pound. I've kept it safe in a napkin. The Lord expects us to trade with the pound, with the talents, 
to be about his business. To engage with that, that gospel that the Lord has given to us. Remember the lepers? When there had been a great famine in Samaria, the Syrians had uh, see, laid siege to the city, and the Lord granted great deliverance. And the lepers went out late in the evening, starving, and they said, we can but die. And they discovered that the Syrians had left, and the tents were there, full of booty. And they looked at one another after they had carried some stocks back, presumably to a safe place, and they said, what we do is not work, not good. It's not well. The Lord has revealed to us good news of deliverance, of spoil, of abundance, and we keep it to ourselves. It was as if they said, a curse will come upon us if we do not go into the city and report our discovery. And that's the mindset that we should have in gospel work. Woe is me. The Lord has revealed to me his son as saviour. I know that which affords joys that this world can never provide. Am I making it known? That's the apostles thinking here. Verse 17. For if I do this thing willingly, gladly, joyfully, I have a reward. Every true faithful servant of Christ will know that final reward. The well done, good and faithful servant. The crown of life, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord has laid up for his servants. There is that reward, he says. But if against my will, if I carry the gospel reluctantly, resentfully, half-heartedly, doing it begrudgingly or simply out of duty, but with no sense of privilege and responsibility. He says, well, a gospel, a, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Again, he looks at what has been entrusted to him. It's importance. It's commission what the Lord intended for it. He's committed it to me, and I've not carried it. I'm like an unfaithful messenger, a broken tooth that is a sore trial to the owner. What is my reward then, he says, verse 18. Probably the, the meaning here is this. Well, why can I expect a reward then? Verily, he says, that when I preach the gospel, I make, may make the gospel of Christ without charge. Some understand this to mean this is part of his earthly reward because it was such a glorious thing for, for him to carry that gospel here and there and he never in any way give, gave the impression that he did it for earthly rewards or motives. He had a reward anyway. The reward of glorifying that gospel in all its freeness. It was a gospel of grace which he graciously communicated. Freely communicated. In a way, the motive and the way in which the gospel preacher commends that message illustrates the message itself. It is a gospel of free grace and it is to be freely given. Freely you have received, says the Lord, freely give. And that's what Paul was doing here. And he adds that I abuse not my power in the gospel. His power in the gospel here is what he's been speaking about earlier in the chapter. The right that he had as a gospel minister, like the ox that is not to be muzzled when it treads out the corn, so those that live of the gospel, that preach the gospel should live of the gospel, he said. That's my power, my right. But I don't overuse it. Here it's translated, 
abused. The idea is that he didn't take advantage of that position because it was his joy and pleasure to demonstrate the gospel freely and to disarm all those critics who said Paul's in it for the money. Verse 19, for though I be free from all men, he may be speaking about the fact that he wasn't a slave, as many of his hearers and readers would have been in the Roman world. Or he may mean thereby free from all men is that he wasn't at the behest of the Jewish religious authorities. He was a free man in the sense he was ultimately accountable only to Christ. No one could tell him how to conduct himself other than Christ. Not the Jews, not the leaders of the synagogues, not the Gentiles. Yet he says, have I made myself a servant or a slave unto all that I might gain the more? He placed himself in the position of a servant. He bound himself. He denied himself in order that he might put the interests of others ahead of, ahead, ahead of his own comforts in life and conveniences. Do we have that mindset? As we go about the Lord's business, as we seek to um, win others for Christ, do we say, I put their interests ahead of my interests. Paul's going to then spend the next three verses speaking about something that we could be rather confused by because it has in our society negative connotations, doesn't it? Verse 22 says, I am made all things to all men. I think that was Tyndale's phrase translated here. But people use that today negatively to describe people who have no real convictions. Well, they're all things to all men. If they're with one person, they agree with him. If they're with another person, they agree with him. And it's said in a disparaging way. But Paul here uses it in a way to commend his spirit and his attitude. So what does he mean? Of course, he doesn't mean here that he compromises important principles and sound doctrines. He doesn't mean anything like that. He can't mean that. We see how firm he is about those things. They're non-negotiable. So what is he speaking about here? Well, he's speaking about accommodating himself to the customs and the mindset of his hearers. So in verse 20 he says, unto the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. And again, he says, and this is similarly speaking about the Jews, them that are under the law. He's probably thinking here about the ceremonial law, the various feasts, the various rites and observances of the old Jewish religion. And as far as they didn't affect his conscience, he knew that these things had been fulfilled in Christ, superseded by his great work at Calvary. But he didn't make any bones about it when he was amongst the Jews. He was respectful. That's why he uh, required Timothy to be circumcised. It wasn't that he thought circumcision was necessary. If you read Acts chapter 15, 16, you'll see that there's been a great debate in Jerusalem saying, well, we don't require the Gentiles to be circumcised. This is an old Jewish rite. But he has Timothy circumcised, hard on the hills of that debate and discussion. Why? Because Timothy is going to come with him as part of his missionary assistant, part and party. And he doesn't want to be a stumbling block when he's amongst the Jewish people. To the Jews I became as a Jew. I didn't make unnecessary points. I didn't rub them up the wrong way 
where I didn't need to because I was concerned to reach their souls with the gospel. Verse 21, to them that are without law, as without law. Again, he's thinking here primarily about the old laws of Israel. The Gentiles knew nothing of those laws. In fact, sometimes they would have found the Jewish laws irksome when the Jews required them in certain cultural settings. But Paul is saying here, when I was amongst the Jew Gentiles, I didn't go out of my way to irritate them by keeping old Jewish feasts because I was a Jew. But he makes this caveat, and we must note this in verse 21. Being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. Now there are, and there always have been, a minority of professing Christians who we call antinomians. An antinomian, well, nomos means law. Anti means against. And there are in our day those who, they may not like the label, but that's what they say. Well, we are not under the law. And they mean the Ten Commandments. They are part of the Jewish nation. And we are Christians. Christ has kept the law for us, they say, so we don't have to. But this verse makes it clear Paul was not an antinomian. There were times when certain of the Mosaic laws, those ceremonial laws, he wouldn't, uh, uh, he, he wouldn't um, keep them when he was with Gentile people. But he says, let me make it absolutely clear here. I'm not without law to God. I'm under the law to Christ. As a Christian, I recognize that great and perfect moral law given to Israel, written on stone to show its permanence. I keep that law, the Ten Commandments, still. To the weak, he says, verse 22, became I as weak. We've already dealt with this. Those who had scruples about eating certain foods, probably included in this phrase here, I wanted to win them for Christ. So I didn't put them on the back foot the first time they heard the gospel because they saw that I was eating pork or some other meat that they would find a stumbling block. To the weak, I became as weak. I accommodated myself to their thinking and their customs so far as I could without, uh, with good conscience. And he says here, verse 22, at the end, and verse 23, for the gospel's sake. He was willing to deny himself all sorts of liberties, all sorts of enjoyments, eating food, avoiding old ceremonies that now no longer he had an obligation to keep. But in order to promote the gospel, he would deny those liberties and he would fit in with the customs of those people he was with in order to win them for Christ. So this is all about self-denial. Then we come to verse 24 to verse 27 because now he's going to, at the end of this chapter, give us this principle. And it's for all of us. Perhaps verses 20 to 22, we can learn from them, but Peter, Paul is talking more about his own gospel situation. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. He speaks about athletes. Then in verse 26, he speaks about wrestlers or boxers. So fight I not as one that beats the air. Well, we're very familiar with the Olympic Games and they originated from Greece, but the Greeks had more than just the Olympics. They had four very prominent games that took place at various intervals in their calendar. And one was held in Corinth. 
called the Isthmian Games. An isthmus is that narrow lick of land that joins two larger bodies, and there is an isthmus that runs between Corinth and mainland Greece, or the Achaia Peninsula and Greece. And at the head of this isthmus, they had a games every four years, apparently, and it was very close to Corinth. And so probably here, when he says, know ye not, he's saying, well, you all know. You know those games. You're familiar with them. They're just outside your, outside your own city. And you know the way in which the competitors prepare themselves. You know the exertions and the uh, disciplines that they employ in order to ensure that they have the best opportunity of winning, of being the master, the mastery, as verse 25 says here. You know these things, he says. And in verse 25, every man that strives for the mastery, he says, is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Apparently, if you won the games, whether it be the Olympics or the Isthmian Games or some other games, then what was the reward? Well, firstly, you got a garland of flowers placed around your neck. They didn't last long, did you? They were corruptible in that sense. They soon withered. But more than that, you would often receive a great homecoming. You know when a football team wins some cup, they have an open-top bus and they ride into the, the city and everyone's cheering. Well, something like that would have happened in your hometown if you were the winner of one of the key races. Also, apparently, you would get, receive a pension from the town. Regular support as a reward. And in certain circumstances, you were exempt from taxes. That's a, an interesting theme on budget day, isn't it? To suddenly be pronounced, well, because you won the race. For our town or village, you're exempt from all local taxes. Well, he says, verse 25, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. That's enough incentive for them to be temperate in all things, uh, to exert themselves in the race. But we are incorruptible. We have far, far greater incentive, he says, to self-discipline, to self-denial, to do everything in a spiritual sense that these Greek gamesmen do in a physical sense. We have far greater inducement we have an incorruptible crown, an inheritance that will not fade away, an eternal right to glory, the home call and welcome of the justified spirits of saints in heaven to receive us on that last great day. The inducements, the crown, the reward for the believer uh, to self-denial is, so, uh, is much greater and richer. And yet so often, how poorly do we reflect the picture that the apostle borrows here in these verses. So let's go through them. First of all, he says, verse 24, so run that you may obtain well, in this verse, he's saying, everyone runs the race. But as you run that race, you know that only one person is going to receive that pension, that tax exemption, and all the other perks of victory. Only one. So they all run with great earnestness, knowing that there's only one chance. Now, the apostle says, that's how you should run as a Christian. Of course, the reward is not for one, but for all who are faithful servants of Jesus Christ. 
those who truly, by faith and patience, follow uh, the, in the footsteps of those who have gone before will inherit the promises. But the apostle says we should run with the same spirit and gusto and earnestness of those runners who run knowing there's only going to be one winner. That should be our spirit. What do they do? They run with their eye to the crown. They are well motivated. And we ought likewise to have great motives. They run with constant exertion. Not giving up. Not uh, wandering around for a breather. They press toward the mark. As Paul said. And he pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. They deny themselves. We'll come to this in a moment. Verse 25. Temperate in all things. We, are like, we ought to follow them in this respect. They give themselves wholly to that task. Every part of their life revolves around being the best athlete or boxer within their particular discipline. And you see that increasingly today in professional sports. Uh, people test their bodies to the limit. I know, I've read of one tennis player that every morning he gets up and he checks the color of his urine. Has to be the same every day. He wants to be absolutely sure that his body is perfectly hydrated to the same uh, optimum level at all times. Well, the Lord calls us here through the apostle and says we are to have that same spirit. Are we wholly devoted to the obedience of Christ, service of our God, devotion to his kingdom and cause? That's the spirit that the apostle exhorts us to here. Verse 25 then, every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. This word temperate, it means to abstain from everything that may sap our energy or limit our strength and stamina. It's a picture from the games. They identified anything in their life. They wouldn't drink alcohol, for example. They wouldn't overeat. They wouldn't indulge in anything that was going to inhibit uh, the optimum performance of their bodies. And the apostle says, this should be the spirit that every Christian has in the pursuit of holiness, in seeking to be diligent and faithful to that calling, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Do we look at our lives and say, I'm going to have to give that pursuit up. I'm going to have to abandon that dream. I'm going to have to forfeit that opportunity in this world because I know that it will inhibit my usefulness to Christ. It will hold me back in my pursuit of a growth in grace with God's blessing. This is the mind that the believer is to have. Temperate in all things. Not just sinful things, that goes without saying but in all things, things which are uh, permissible, and yet if they hindrance. Remember what Paul, uh, Paul says in Hebrews chapter 12, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. The weights are not all sins because they're dealt with separately. We may have to say, if we are temperate, as the apostle exhorts here, well, I think I'm having too much leisure. I'm giving myself too much pleasure time. I need to deny my, my body, my natural self and my natural inclinations, those things. It's perhaps not a risk at the moment, but our social lives can sometimes sap our strength 
in the pursuit of serving the Lord, of knowing him, of expanding our knowledge and our usefulness in his kingdom. We're so busy entertaining friends and visiting friends and family, perhaps. I know it's not the case at the moment, but when the cork is finally taken off the bottle and everyone goes back to normal as people hope for, we need to remember not to overindulge in social activity if it means that our spiritual lives suffer and we are not uh, advancing in the pursuit of holiness and godliness and a knowledge of Christ and a usefulness in his kingdom. But we must move on. He says here, verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. Probably this word uncertainly here, it, it, it means to, to not have a clear aim, not have a clear goal or plan in life. And there are times when as believers we can be like that. Can you imagine a, a runner going round the Olympic course uh, and he just aimlessly ran around? He was running, but you could tell just by looking at him that he really didn't have much motive, much conviction about the great honor of winning. And that's what Paul is referring to here. Many do not seem to have that deep conviction that there will be a reward at the end of the Christian race. Paul says, I don't run uncertainly. He knew whom he had believed. He believed that those who are faithful to that calling would receive eternal blessing and reward. I therefore so run so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Well, this may refer to what we call shadow boxing. Just uh, practicing. Making out you're, you're beating someone and you're just doing this. Probably what the apostle means here is something a bit more than that. Someone who doesn't land their punches. Uh, the boxer in the games here, his aim was to gained the mastery, the victory over his uh, opponent. And every amount of effort that he used uh, that missed the target was wasted energy. He wanted to land the punches. And here the apostle's thinking of himself. The next verse tells us, but I keep under my body. I aim to hit below the eye. He's talking about himself here. His old flesh, his old natural inclinations for ease, for earthly enjoyment. We all have them, don't we? Let's take it easy. Let's focus upon those things that I enjoy doing, those things that are pleasurable. I'll give myself to those. I'll give myself full reward in those things. No, says the apostle, I keep under my body. I bring it into servitude. I put it in its place, like the dog that's been smacked on the nose and told, that's your place down there. You do as you're told. You are my servant. The apostle's using that analogy and he's saying, my natural desire is to pursue all my earthly interests, uh, to give myself as much time as I need to enjoy and derive pleasure from this life. The apostle says, no, I deny myself, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The word castaway here, it means to be rejected metal, something that's examined and the metal's bad. It's not the correct alloy. 
you examine coins in those days, and uh, if they were not correct, then they were rejected, cast away. And the apostle says, I, my mindset, my approach to life is such that I believe that it's possible that I, having been a preacher even, should at the end prove to be a castaway, a reprobate. Do we have that mindset? This is the mindset the apostle urges upon every genuine Christian. Of course, we are saved by grace. We rejoice in that final perseverance or preservation of the saints that Scripture makes clear. But our approach, if we love the Lord, if we've known his grace, is to have this spirit of self-denial. We have to identify those things in our lives that will hold us back. Too much internet, too much television, too much sport, too much indulgence in earthly pursuits, reading books that really are lightweight and trivial, magazines, all these things can be a hindrance to us. The apostle says, I keep under my body those natural tastes and inclinations that I have. Well, may the Lord help us to imitate the apostle and strive as these ancient runners to be faithful and to be fruitful in the service of Jesus Christ. We close with 467. Oh, that